Good Sunday morning to you, Delaware basketball community. Welcome to a brand new edition of Holding Court here on the First Day Hoops Report YouTube channel. I am, of course, First Day Hoops Report founding editor and Holding Court host, Chris Stevens. Hopefully you all are doing well out there. Of course, we're recording this on a Sunday morning. Some of y'all will probably see it a little after that. But if you're wondering why I'm wearing a hoodie, it's drop 20 degrees because if you're outside Saturday at any point, it was like climate change is real because the um, temperatures were in the 80s on Saturday. And of course, I was down at a Delaware State University in Dover covering uh, the football game for HBCU Sports, which is, of course, my day job. And um, again, I'm happy to say that my, that job won't interfere with First State Hoops Report. As we are getting into the nuts and bolts of basketball season, college um, is just around the corner, literally around the corner. Some teams start playing next week. And of course, the week after that, not this Monday coming, but the Monday after that, November 6th, winter practice starts. So we are literally in the throes of basketball season, very much excited to be back for our fifth year of covering high school ball here in Delaware. And of course, November is going to be pretty much us going around to all the different colleges. I've already been to Goldie Beacom's women's practice. I got an appointment with Goldie Beacom's men coming up this week. And of course, Delaware State has two scrimmages, not scrimmages, uh, ex exhibitions, excuse me, on Thursday, and I will be there. And of course, I'll catch up with UD, Wilm U, Dell Tech, all during the course of November. So I'm very much excited about getting back out into the basketball community and covering some basketball because just a couple of months off has just been too too long for me. <laughs> so glad to be back in the business of covering basketball. But yeah, it was hot yesterday. Like literally, I wore shorts and a t-shirt down to Delaware State. And I'm thinking everybody in that press box is going to look at me like I've lost my mind because sports writers, we have a, a reputation as being the worst dressed people in journalism anyway. <laughs> so, you know, we don't, wear the uh, suits and ties and the uh, pencil skirts and the uh, business suits like the men and women that cover, you will say, uh, politics and civics and business and education. Sports writers, we just throw on whatever clean for the most part. We may iron it. We may not. <laughs> but we're going to be there, you know, in our Sunday worst. <laughs> so that is why. You know, I, I thought that, you know, going down there with a Garfield T-shirt and basketball shirts was going to have me looking crazy, but it was hot. Everybody was dressed for the occasion down there. So I was like, whew, thank goodness I don't look too terrible, but we're here now. So now it's about, it feel, it's 60 degrees outside. It's crazy because I went to bed last night, turned on my fan, turned on my AC because I can't sleep hot. And I woke up this morning, you know, teeth chattering. Um, I had to clean the icicles off my beard because good Lord, it was cold when I woke up this morning. I was like, whew. Turn all this off quickly. And that's why I still have the hoodie on because I'm still trying to warm up a little bit before I head out for a walk before we is this week eight or week nine in the NFL season? Somebody week eight. Or is it week nine? Doggone it. It's one of these weeks of the NFL season. We're almost at the halfway point. I know that much. So we're close to the halfway point in the NFL season, but I'm gonna squeeze in a walk before I, you know, sit down, watch some of these games and start doing some more notes for work and of course first day hoops report. That being said, the very express purpose of this episode is going to be to update you guys on, you know, some of the college stuff that's been going on, the preseason polls and all of that. And of course, maybe one more thing about the uh, the quick little reel that I did on Instagram about um, transferring and how it relates to the uh, young men that, uh, that have transferred from Seaford to Middletown. I'll probably talk more about that as we get closer to the end of the episode. But as far as college, um, I was fortunate enough to be on the MEAC um, virtual media day zoom this week. Um, Delaware state, why am I, I'm in all the time. Maybe I guess it's cause I'm trying to wake up still trying to wake up, still trying to warm up, but yes, Delaware state, the men were picked sixth and women were picked seventh. Now it's important to note that the MEAC changes weekly. Like it, like it is a fluid situation in every single sport, volleyball, cross country, track and field, Tennis, bowling. I mean, the MEAG is eight teams now. It, there was a time. There was a time when it was actually twelve. Maybe it was even thirteen. Because let's see: Savannah State, and A and T, Fam, U, Baton, Cookman left. Yeah, that was. Yeah, MEAG had thirteen overall members, and there were eleven or twelve that played football because Coppin State and UMES don't have football teams. I know people have been saying, and I know you know. People have been begging for UMES to reinstate football. I'm going to tell you why that's not going to happen. When UMES 
dropped football in the winter of 1980. They couldn't find $100,000 to run a football program. That was in 1980. We are in 2023. I can guarantee you that the price of a football program in 2023 is more than $100,000. So people asking for UMES to reinstate football, stop. It's not going to happen until unless somebody just drops a significant donation for upgrades to their stadium. Because their stadium is just sitting there as far as I know. I mean, it's not in terrible disrepair, but I mean, it's just their football stadium is just there. So. But yeah, if somebody drops like a $20 million donation on it and says, hey, go restart football, then yeah, maybe UMS will do it. But And of course, they've all, I mean, they're competing with Salisbury, believe it or not, because Salisbury started, you know, dominating the recruiting area for football around the late 70s and early 80s. And by that time, Delaware State had started to make some inroads with, you know, Eastern Shore kids. So it was like UMS, UMS's AD said, I can't have, you know, our kids, you know, doing things. I think I think it was in the Washington Post now um, that the uh, athletic director that's named after uh, Dr. Heisch that they were literally football players were literally trading shoes off in between plays, like guys that were subbing out would literally take off their shoes and give their shoes to another player. That was crazy for 1979. It definitely wouldn't fly in 2023. Not saying UMS would do that, but I'm just saying. Sorry, got off the trail a little bit, but yeah. UMS and Cobb don't have football, so it's six football playing schools right now. Delaware State, Howard, Morgan State, North Carolina, A&T, Norfolk State, South Carolina State, and Howard. And I saw Howard uh, play Delaware State this weekend. Um, Not very good. Not very good if you're a Hornet fan. I've already talked about that for my day job. If you want me to share that information with you, I will give you the first day who's for email and the link. You say, hey, Chris, I know you mentioned Delaware State football in your recent holding court. What have you said about it? And I'll be glad to share it with you. But it's about basketball. Delaware State men are picked sixth in the MEAC. Martez Robinson is first team all conference, um, all preseason selection. Brandon Stone and Jevin Muniz are second team. And we got two Delaware kids on the squad. Actually, three, pardon me, three. We have three Delaware kids on the Delaware State squad this year for the men. Um, Corey Perkins, of course, has been there from the start with Coach Dan Waterman. Uh, Dean Shepard from Tower Hill, the pre the last year's player of the year. Can't wait to see him in college. I think he's going to shine at that level. And uh, who else? Ricky Deadwiler. Yes, Ricky Deadwiler III is also on the roster at Delaware State University. So you've got three Delaware kids. You've got two Tower Hill kids and a Sanford kid. Go see him play. And, of course, we all know Stan, Stan Waterman, the, probably the greatest high school basketball coach this state has ever seen. And, of course, this is the year that a lot of coaches, new coaches, get to see the fruit, bear, see the fruit, see the trees bear fruit is what I'm trying to say that he's had two years to uh, flush out the players from Eric Skeeters, get two player, two years to get the, his kind of kids in there. And I think this Delaware State team is probably going to surprise some people. Like, I don't see a world where UMES and Morgan State, who are fourth and fifth, respectively, are that much better than Delaware State. I just don't see that happening. And maybe it's just my bias as an alum, but I feel like Delaware State's probably going to finish on third or fourth. Really depends on what North Carolina Central does because North Carolina Central, of course, is coached by the great Lavelle Moton, and of course, he always finds a way to get players. So, but I think Delaware, I don't think it's out of realm possibility that Delaware State's a top four men's team in the MEAC. I don't, and I will probably report back more when I go see them in their exhibition game um, later this week. Uh, the women were picked seventh, and the women have an interesting uh, situation going on because uh, the coach that was there before, she didn't make it through the end of last season. And the coach that coached through the end of last season is the interim coach this year, Jasmine Turner. Had a chance to talk to her media day on a – was it Wednesday or Thursday? It was Thursday. And, yeah, she was very excited about the opportunity because Coach Turner's been around. She's a young coach. I don't even think she's 30 yet. Or she, if she is, she probably just turned 30. But she's been around. You know, she's coached at Division Two, II, Division Three. She's been a head coach in Division Two. So being a head coach at Division One school is likely her dream. And I feel like – this group is going to respond better than her, for her than they did in the previous um, administration. Well, the previous head coach. I mean, it's pretty much the same administration because uh, Coach Turner was an assistant, and so was uh, Sherelle Dennis, who, of course, has roots in this area. She played at Christiana, played at Lincoln, um, coached at Apo, Newark Charter. Not, yeah, Newark Charter. Yeah, so Coach Dennis has been around. So this is a younger staff you know, with some moving parts and they all seem to, it seems like the vibe is better, you know, just from looking at, just from looking at their practice on Instagram, it just seems like the vibe is better for Delaware State women's basketball. So, but 
Melrose State women's, I mean, MAC women's basketball is a little more depth heavy than the men. Uh, Howard is very good. Howard, you know, Howard, you know, you're good when you get a, uh, a, a, a web series about your team defending their championship. I had a chance to write that story for HBC Sports. That was pretty cool. North, Norfolk State, of course, won it last year. And uh, that if people missed that great um, story, Dawn Staley, because um, South Carolina was who Norfolk State played in the first round. And Norfolk State hung with them for a little bit, but, of course, South Carolina pulled away. And Coach Staley came into the locker room and just – went down the line and talked about what she liked about each player, what she liked about Coach Larry Vickers. It was pretty cool. And I, if, when you're from a smaller school in an HBCU, you get that kind of affirmation from Dawn Staley. It can only make your program better. Lo and behold, uh, Norfolk State got Diamond Johnson. If you're not familiar, you know, she played at Rutgers. Last year played at NC State. She was ACC Sixth Woman of the Year. She is a bucket. She will get them in abundance. So, yeah, Norfolk State and Howard easily won too, but – as far as like third in Delaware and Morgan State is picked third. And Ed Davis is my guy. You know, when he coached at Delaware State, I, I, I was a student reporter. So I know Coach Davis fairly well. Great guy. Not afraid to say what's on his mind. By any stretch of imagination, one of, the favorite, one of my favorite coaches that I've ever covered in my 21 going on 22 years in this business. But I still think that Delaware State, you know, the women and we have two uh, local kids on the women's team, too. Uh, Janiah Perkins Jackson, remember her from Hodson? She went out to um, finish her high school career in California. She played a couple years at Cal Hills Dominguez in a Division II school. And she came back home and she made the uh, Delaware State women's team as a walk-on. So that is a great story. Chances are we'll be talking about that in the near future. And uh, Julia Salour, remember her from Cape Henlopen? Uh, she redshirted last year and she now is on the active roster this year. So two more Delaware kids on the Delaware State women's team. Go see them. And I feel like, yeah, maybe seventh might be right to start for this Delaware State women's team. But again, like I said a couple of weeks ago, I don't see any reason why they can't be top four either. It really just depends on, you know, week to week because the MIAC is a gauntlet. Every, like I said, every sport, it is a gauntlet. You will be surprised. You'll find one day that Howard is the t- at the top of the men's game, but they lost to South Carolina State. Or you'll find that, UMES is leading the, the women's team after the women's league after like maybe four or five games or something, you know, just because of one upset here and there. So just be mindful of, you know, where, I mean, preseason polls, coaches say it all the time. It means nothing, but they pay attention. They all do. <laughs> they all do. I mean, we have, we have, we have grown adults complaining about high school uh, preseason, pre, pre, preseason polls around here. So. That wink was terrible. <laughs> when you're looking in the camera, you're thinking you're really cool. But then when you can see the facial expressions you make on camera, oh, my God, it's terrible. That wink just kind of like went out. You know, when you when you have bad eyes, things like that. happen. But, yeah, um, the Del- UD men were picked to finish uh, fourth. Uh, Jair Davis from Sanford, uh, on- the only boys basketball player to be all state first team four years in high school. He was picked to the um, second team all conference. And. We're looking forward to Delaware State and UD men playing on November 15th. That is a hot ticket. If it hasn't sold out already, go get your tickets. I think Delaware State is hosting, so you'll probably have to um, hit up the Delaware State ticket office. If that game isn't sold out already, you'll want to be in the building. And and you won't have many chances to be in the building because the building is only about 2,000 seats. So, yeah, get those tickets while you can. (laughs) They're going to go fast. Uh, We will have four kids, you know, likely playing that day from Delaware and, of course, the greatest Delaware High School coach of all time is now coaching one of the college programs. And, of course, he's a UD grad. So that's going to be a fun ticket. But, of course, being the media, I can get there for free. <laughs> and I will be in the building with my cameras and my laptops, you know, covering that game, you know, seeing what, seeing who's – seeing which team – that game That game usually tells me a lot about who's going to have the better year and who's going to be good in their conference. Because I'll never forget the year that uh, Delaware State, when they had Kendall Gray um, from Polytech. Went to a, went to the um, went to the Bob and beat UD. I think it was I think it was about double digits actually, and it was like wow, this Delaware State team might actually have something. And lo and behold, they made it to the MIAC championship game that year. That was that had to be a tough year for the Gray family because uh, uh, it was 2015 because Kendall was playing in the MIAC championship game down in Virginia, and Jawan was playing in the boys championship game for Polytech against uh, Slaziano at the Bob. I, want, I always wonder how the great parent, how the great family pulled that off. Did they kind of like draw straws, you know, rock, paper, scissors, shoot? I don't know. 
But that, that had to be a good feeling for that family, though, even though they both came up short that day, unfortunately. But it was nice to have two kids of different levels in the championship game that mattered. That was pretty cool. I just thought about that. But yeah, the 2014-15 meeting, uh, UD, DSU went up to UD and took care of business. I was like, wow, this Delaware State team might have something. And of course, they had a little bit. Made it to the MIAC championship game. So that game is going to tell me a lot about either side. Whoever um, whoever plays best is probably going to be you know, better served, better equipped to compete in their conference because UD and DSU, as much as there's this uneasiness about the rivalry because Delaware State to HBCU and UD treats itself as a long lost cousin of the Ivy League, there's still some uh, competitiveness there. And it'll be very interesting to see. Um, UD women were picked to uh, finish uh, tied, tied for fifth, I believe. And uh, a couple of Delaware, there's one Delaware kid that is named a Coastal Athletic Conference a Preseason Player of the Year, Kylie Cornegate Lucas. She played the season Rodney. She finished her high school career elsewhere, but she still very much has roots in Delaware. She's the Preseason Player of the Year, a senior from Towson. And, of course, we got a few uh, kids in the Colonial from our fair state. We got Kylie Cornegate Lucas and India Johnston on Caravel. And last year's uh, CAA champion and NCAA representative, Monmouth, of course, has Amaya Carroll from Sanford. So, it's going to be interesting to see how those matchups come to pass when, you know, when Monmouth comes to UD and when Towson comes to UD and when Towson plays Monmouth. So that will be very interesting. I mean, it's good. It's good that we have kids playing on the local level. I'm going to do – I'm going to put together a list. And it's going to be pinned at the top of um, all of my social media feeds for all of our kids playing college basketball, not just Division One. So if you have – if you're listening to this or watching this, don't think it's just listen, limited to Division One because college basketball is college basketball – we say it all the time in our circles, in the media, and in the observation game. If you can get somebody to at least pay for part of your education, ain't no shame in it. Whether it's JUCO, whether it's NAIA, Division Three, Division Two, if you're fortunate enough to be a Division One, you don't like I said before. You want somebody to pay for at least sixty percent of your education. If you can do that, then it doesn't matter where it is. You could be playing at, you know, Oklahoma Panhandle State, and yes, that is a real university. The Oklahoma Panhandle State. If you go to Oklahoma Panhandle State and Oklahoma Panhandle State says, hey, uh, we got about 70 percent of grants here. We got, you know, low low cost loans. We even have scholarship opportunities from an academic standpoint. All you have to do is just write this essay or get this internship. Take it. Take it. Because this education thing ain't cheap. I graduated from Delaware State in 2007. I still have student loans in 2023. You want somebody to pay for your education as much as possible. Doesn't matter where it is. Get that money. Or, or, as, the, or as the great Diamond uh, said on Players Club, make that money. Don't let that money make you. <laughs> so make, get, get the most ed for your education that you can. And if you get to play ball doing it, even better. So, yeah, we're, we're again, if, if you feel like I'm talking about making a list and you feel like, oh, my kid isn't represented. I don't think they would be represented because they're in JUCO or they're in Division Three or NAI. Nope. Send it. I'm putting together an entire list because I know we got at least 100 kids playing college basketball from Delaware right now. And the local kids that are coming up now need to see it because if they can see it, Asia Wilson said, if you can see her, you can be her. So for these kids, if you see, you know, like Lauren Park at Lauren Park Lane at Mississippi State, you see... Uh, Olivia Tucker and uh, Emma Kirby at what school is that? Sacred Heart. Sacred Heart. Yes, I got that right. Sacred Heart. Olivia Tucker and Emma Kirby at Sacred Heart. If you see Janaya Perkins Jackson at Delaware State, you see India Johnston and Kylie Cornegate Lucas at Towson. You know, you see Dean Shepard at Delaware State. You see uh, Elijah Allen at Westchester, on and on and on. I mean, so many kids are playing college basketball right now. Dayon Polk at, uh, at Army. Yes, it can be done. It can be done. You don't have to leave Delaware. And granted, I'm going to talk about the transfer stuff in a minute. But if you stick it out here, you know, and it, granted, we'll talk about why you probably need to get with the best program in the state possible to be seen by college coaches. But if you stick it out here, the chances are you can be found. And remember, we have two Delaware kids. We have two kids that play every minute of high school ball in Delaware that are playing in the NBA right now. Bones Highland is with the L.A. Clippers. Dante DiVincenzo is with the New York Knicks. And they are playing. 
They're not just sitting the bench. They ain't sitting there passing out the towels, handing off the Gatorade. They get actually get in the game and make things happen. So please don't let anybody tell you that you can't come from Delaware and make and not make it. You absolutely can. You absolutely can. And that brings me to the transfer portal or the uh, transfer hullabaloo, if you if you will. I like to, I always like to say I like the American Dream Dusty Rose. If you don't know, that's one of my favorite wrestlers of all time, the late great American Dream Dusty Rose. If you will, baby. Funky like a monkey. Take it to the pay window. The world's heavyweight champion. Okay, all right, that's enough of that. Um, yes, uh, three middle town young men, all brothers, uh, actually had their transfer hearing denied a couple of weeks ago. Then they went in front of, I guess it's a legislative um, branch, and they actually got approved this time. So, yes, they were eligible to play football, which is why they went there in the first place, but they're also going to play basketball. And I've seen and heard a lot of complaining about transfer rules here in Delaware. And I did a quick little video on my on the Instagram feed. It's, you've seen it already. People have commented on it. People have said, you know, they've said their piece and I respect their piece because most of the time, you know, most of the comments have been like right in line with my line of thinking when I was putting that together because I was just I was just so tired of hearing, you know, how the sanctity of high school sports is in jeopardy because kids are changing schools. Let me tell you what really is the, um, putting the sanctity of high school sports in jeopardy. The lack of care for public education. That's what's putting the sanctity of high school sports in jeopardy. Let's be clear about that. I have to remember I can't cuss because, you know, there are going to be kids watching this. I always take into account anytime I do hold in court that I have to be as professional as possible because I don't want these kids to be thinking like, wow, Mr. Stevens and Mr. Chris can go off like this. And I can too. No, there's a time and a place for everything. Believe me. <laughs> so the, I, I, tr I try to... Uh, not get too passionate because Pat for a Stevens family trait is a four is four letter words when it comes to passion and discussing things. We cuss all the time. Cussing is our second language. Some people, you know, are are indigenous folk. You know, they have certain languages. Folks that immigrate from overseas, they may speak French, they may speak Spanish, they may speak uh, Japanese, Chinese, Italian, Portuguese. Stevens family, our second language is cussing. So I have to be real mindful of that when I step on this holding court because I don't want these kids to be thinking like, wow, if Chris can go off, I can go off too. No, 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 no. <laughs> But yes, let's be clear about that. The, 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 the sanctity of high school sports in Delaware is in jeopardy because nobody gives a you-know-what about public education. I've told you this story before. When Wilmington Charter opened up in 1999 in Wilmington High's building, even at 17, 18 years old, I knew that this was going to be the new wave for public education because Del for education because Delaware is quick to hop on a trend. And I, I mean, I don't mean that from like a cultural perspective because Delaware is its own unique place. People come here all the time like, wow, we ain't no Wilmington was like that. Well, now, if you don't know, now you know. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when, when Wilmington Charter opened up, it felt like, you know, some it felt, it felt like even it, the elders were telling us like, yo, this is going to set a bad precedent. And, even, and I, you know, I've always been wanting to listen to, you know, people with experience. I'm like, okay, just watch out for this. And lo and behold, there are probably more charter schools than there are public, public schools at this point or schools that aren't public schools because you have charters, you have Votex, you have faith-based institutions. And I'm not going to get into the faith-based thing because my religious leanings have nothing to do with anyone else's. It's definitely a separation of church and state here on First Day Hoops Report. I don't want to get into that. But I will say that it has been a shock to see more kids of black kids. I'll just say it, more black kids at these schools because back in those days, it wasn't really a welcome thing when I was coming along. So, I mean, I mean, yeah, there were kids that went there. I mean, because they were obviously athletes, but, you know, it's starting to become more of a thing now. But I'll say this again. There's no reason that the Christina School District, Ray Clay, should be struggling to field teams, competitive teams, we'll say. I mean, they'll field teams, but they just won't be competitive. But there's no reason for Red Clay and Christiana, um, Christina School District to be struggling, fielding, um, struggling to field competitive teams because those were the dominant forces when I was coming up. Dickinson was doggone good at football. Oh, my God, so good at football. McCain was solid in football and could jump up and surprise you in basketball. Um, A.I. DuPont was good in football and basketball. 
Wilmington High was football and basketball for a very long time. Um, Wilmington High closed in 1999. Their last state championship was in 1988. They still have the second most state championships of any boys basketball program in the state. And they haven't won one in 35 years because they haven't been open in 24. So there's that. You know, Christina, oh my gosh. Newark was dominant in football. Christiana had good teams. Glasgow came of age in the 80s and 90s and were good in football and basketball. Now it's almost like they're all an afterthought. And that's because people just stopped caring about public education. I mean, we can go all the way back to the 70s when DSEG happened and PS DuPont was changed into a middle school and DeLaware is now a social services center. Because a lot of DeLaware kids came from Southbridge and Dunleith. And of course, we all know Dunleith is as black as the day is long. So you can say that this has been 45 years in the main because DSEG happened in 1978. Actually, the ruling was 1976, but some so much of the uh, court, you know, wranglings and legal tape and all of that means DSA didn't take effect until the beginning of the 1978-79 school year. So that's where, you know, kids that would have went to Howard or Wilmington or PS or DeLaware, they all started getting filtered out to the, you know, like Brandywine School District, Christina, Red Clay, on and on it goes. And it just happened to be that that dismemberment of the Wilmington school system just ended up being a burden for Newcastle County as a whole because there weren't going to be that many kids that just were going to get on the bus and thrive like that. I mean, you had to, you know, going to school in the city, if you're a city kid, the people in Philly can go to school in Philly. People in Camden can go to school in Camden. People in Baltimore can go to school in Baltimore. People in DC can go to school in DC. People in Newark, New Jersey can go to school in Newark, New Jersey. So why does Wilmington, Delaware not have a public high school? And yes, I love Howard High School with technology. I mean, that's my alma mater. So, I mean, yes, full disclosure, I went to Howard, class of 99. Um, but Howard High School is not a public high school. It's a Votech. You have to apply and have certain prerequisites and qualifications to get in. So, no, it's not like you just show up one day and uh, because you live on the east side and say, hey, I'm here, I'm a Howard student. It's not how it works. So there's there hasn't been a public high school in the city of Wilmington in 24 years, going on 25. Because, I mean, unless, I mean, because you can't just open a high school, you know, in the middle of a skier. So, yeah, we're talking about going on 25 years without a public high school in the city of Wilmington, the, the city's largest, the state's largest city, the state's flagship city. So that's why I get really irritated when people start complaining about kids transferring to school because they don't have any other choice. It's not like you can just stay at McCain. You can stay at A.I., you can stay at Dickinson. You can stay at Christiana. You can stay at Glasgow. You can stay at New Oh, my God. Who would have thought that Newark would be would be on hard times in sports? We're talking about Newark of Butch Patrick, Butter Pressy, um, the Harris family, Corey Wallace. And we're talking about, you know, Glasgow with Corey and Stephen Curtis and um, Mark Edgerson and all of these great young basketball players that went out there and balled out and either went to college or are living as local legends. And those schools just are not factors right now. And no one seems to see the problem with that because nobody seems to care about, again, public education. Because once you dismantle Wilmington's education system, there was going to come a time when even the busing ec epidemic was going to become problematic. And, you know, charter schools, you know, with people you know, throwing money into buildings and saying, hey, we can accept these amount of kids. We can accept these type of kids and leave everyone else to fend for themselves, because that's pretty much what a charter school movement is to me. And full disclosure, for the lat for from March of 2022 to February 2023, I worked for a public relations firm that was heavy on charter school engagement. And it's probably the worst decision I've ever made in my life. I can say that now because now I have a job that I love and now I get to do this you know, free, you know, free and easy because that job lets me do what I do. That previous job didn't let me do what I do. So, yeah. So, yeah. Try, and that and go, and that going against that, you know, it was like, I want, I guess I want to say it was, you know, contradictory. It definitely felt like I was not being true to myself. I'll we'll say that because I, I mean, am I anti-charter? Yeah. I don't want to say it like that, but I'm a, I'll am i say I'm a staunch proponent of public education. I absolutely am. 
because I'm a kid that grew up in Wilmington going to Bancroft. I lived over east side. I went to Bancroft. I went to Garger. Oh, my God, I hated Garger. So Garger is a different story. But Bancroft, I was very proud of. And I'm very proud that uh, my one of my, you know, one of one of the adults that made a great impression on my life, the late Mr. Maurice Pritchett Sr., is, de- is going to be honored with the new school being named the Maurice Pritchett Sr. Academy. It's the only way it could have gone. Because Mr. Pritchett was the East Side, Mr. Pritchett was Bancroft, so very much happy, you know, that that's going to come to pass. When that, you know, when that day opens up, I think I'm going to go and just take a picture in front of the building, like, yo, Mr. Pritchett, this, we are your legacy, and we hope you're proud of us because you know you've done so much for so many of us over the years. You know, rest in peace, Mr. Mr. Pritchett. What a great man. What a great man. Ugh. But yeah, public education. That's why these kids are transferring. And yes, people are going to say, well, the young men came from Seaford and Seaford was good in basketball and they were okay in football. Yeah, recently. But people seem to forget when the DuPont plant at PS closed, I mean, at Seaford closed, that's when a lot of people started, you know, filtering out because that PS, that PS plant was why people were able to send their kids to Seaford because they had steady employment. They had security to be able to buy homes and invest in their kids, you know, ac- athletic and academic pursuits and all of that. Once you lose something like a factory and a plant, it's going to be hard to keep people in the town. It's hard to keep that town prosperous. So, you know, the and, and those kids that transfer, they're well within their right to it. You have Middletown, people are going to, and I think people are upset because it's Middletown, because Middletown, of course, gets everything if you believe everybody else. But what are you going to do? You're going to just, you know, let kids, you know, you know, twist in the wind because you feel like they don't deserve or chance it better. Why is that your determination? And who are you to make that determination? That's my question. If a kid is good enough to make an all state team or an all or be an all conference player at a at a school that doesn't have the resources, then, yes, they should be allowed to test themselves against higher quality competition. And that's what you're going to get with basketball this year, because basketball is going to be dope on all levels, boys and girls. Very much looking forward to seeing, you know, how Salesiano defends their chip, you know, how Middletown's going to bounce back, how Penn's going to bounce back, if Howard can stay in the hunt, this St. E squad that everybody's excited about on the boys' side. On the girls' side, is this Ursuline's year? Can Sanford um, defend? Caravelle's still lurking in the weeds. K. Penlope is going to be very good again. Uh, St. E has a new coach and, and some talent coming with him. It's going to be a fun year. And yes, it's disappointing that out of 50 or 60 high schools, 55 or 60 high schools that maybe 10, 15 aside will be, will have legitimate state championship aspirations. Maybe, but not everybody's going to be good in everything. And I don't hear this complaint about Del Mar and Cape and Smyrna being this good in field hockey. I don't hear this complaint about Salazian and being that good at boys soccer. I don't hear this complaint about Cape Henlope and being that good in lacrosse. Like you need teams to shoot for, quite frankly, because when Tattnall's girls lacrosse team beat uh, Cape Henlope in this past spring for the girls um, championship, that was like probably the biggest upset to happen in Delaware sports and God knows how long. In fact, it was the first in-state loss for a Cape Henlope and girls lacrosse team since 2009. That means that freshmen in the class of 2027 now, some of them weren't born the last time Cape Henlope's girls lacrosse team lost a game in state before the state championship game. These are the type of things that you need. Competition make iron sharpens iron. You need competition for these kids to, you know, have something to shoot for, to build some competitive edge, to build the drive to want to be better, to be better than someone else. So, yes, it is unfortunate, but at the same time, these coaches have to, and, motiv- and the, co- the coaches and players have to do a better job of motivating themselves. You can look at Salazi and and say, oh, my God, you know, they've got an all-star team. What's the point of us playing the season? Or you can say, we want to be the ones to knock them so-and-so's off. That's how they used to do it back in the day. Because you can, because I can tell you from experience, growing up as a kid that with, a, with an older sister that went to Howard, whose first basketball game in person featured A.J. English, for crying out loud. And that Howard team with AJ probably should have won three straight championships. Four, honestly, because if you think about it, I'm going to go to the history books real quick. 83, they could have beat Sally's in the semifinal, didn't do it. 84, they had the best team in the state, but grades cost them, and they lost to um, Cape Henlopen in the first round. 
85, they won states. 86, they lost to Sanford in the semifinal and ended up being one of the most unfortunate chapters, we'll say, in the history of the state tournament that they couldn't finish the game because people were fighting and throwing things in the stands. <laughs> I'll have to uh, I have to ask John Collegia about that. Uh, John Collegia, of course, uh, coached uh, the Conrad girls to a state championship. Of course, his daughter, Stephanie and Julia, Julia are playing in college. And Coach Collegia was at the free throw line when they stopped the game. So I got to ask Coach Collegia about that one of these days. May have him on the uh, – may, may, he might be one of my first guests on home court just to talk about, you know, the rise of Sanford basketball and how strange that had to be when he was trying to shoot a free throw and <laughs> people were fighting behind him. Or maybe it was in front of him. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll have to ask him about that. But, yeah. Um, yeah, you think about it. Howard probably should have won four straight championships between 1983 and 1986. They only won one because somebody stepped up. Cape Henlopez Lopez stepped up in 1984. Sanford got it done in 1986. Is what it is. You know, you you can't just roll over and say, oh, my God, why are we here? You know, this is, oh, they've got, you know, this player that's, you know, already committed to a Division One school. They've got this player who has a stack of offers. They have another player who's probably going to get a stack of offers. You can't let that be the determining factor in your success. You can't let someone else's success be the determining factor in your success. That's a life lesson. That ain't got nothing to do with basketball. That is life. There are people out here who have more things than everybody else. Yes, like I look around and I see people that I went to school with, you know, that are maybe, you know, they have the fancy job, the you know, the home, the cars and all of that. And I could be upset about that. But then again, I remember I have my own place. You know, I work. I have my I have a job that allows that I'm still passionate about and allows me to pursue another passion. So it's not like, you know, you can't just compare yourself to everyone else. You know, that's a life lesson. Comparison is the thief of joy. That's what that's what the old church folks say. Comparison is the thief of joy. Can't compare yourself to what everyone else is doing. So yeah, while Sally's might be great, Ursula might be great, they still have to go out there and play. If somebody has to go out there and play them, why not you? And that's gonna do it for this edition of Holding Court. Greatly appreciate y'all's time as always. All the links that you need to follow us will be in the description below. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And now, oh my God, before I sign off. We have playlists now. So if you want to go back in time to when we first started during the pandemic and we got playlists for each season, 2019, 20, 2020, 21, 21, 22, 22, 23, go back in time, you know, go through each playlist and see that the games we've covered, the highlights from each game, you'll go back, you'll see some memories of different things that happened, you know, when you were in school or when you first started following us, we've come a long way and we still got a ways to come, you know, that with your help, we can do that. So, Thank you all for listening and watching as always. Until the next time, next weekend, take care of yourselves and each other.